Nice meeting you, sir. Today is the 11th of August, 2009. We are at uh, the American Legion Post, number 216 in Margaretville, New York. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name, your date and place of birth, please? My name is Stanley Herman Siegel, born 12-7-24 in New York City. And uh, what, other, what else can I uh, Did you attend school in New York City? I went to uh, PS 28, the High School of Music and Art. I graduated at age uh, 17. I went to Cooper Union for one year. Okay. What year did you graduate? Uh, which school? From, from high school. From high school, 1942. All right. And, and let me just go back uh, a second. Do you remember where you were and what your reaction was when you heard about the bombing Pearl yeah, Harbor? Yes. They, I was 16 years old. They had a wonderful principal at Music and Art, and he had a great assembly, and he told us the bad news. And it was really a solemn moment, and I was very impressed. Mm -hmm. and I remember that. I remember the assembly. I remember that day. His name was Benjamin Steigman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it, was, it was infuriating. Mm -hmm. I was ready to go. <laughs> and once you graduated from high yeah. school, you went on to? I went to, uh, to Cooper Union, but I could not afford to go during the day, so I got a job. I worked during the day, and I went to Cooper Union at night. The most one, I don't know if you know anything about Cooper Union. It's a free school, has a good endowment, endowed it, Peter Cooper, no, one Cooper. Anyway, it was a magnificent school for art and engineering, mm -hmm. and I went there for art. Until for one year, and then I went into the United States Army. Now, were you drafted or were you enlisted? I we went down there, a bunch of guys, and they said, "We well, have your name, and you'll be in soon." I was in in March mm -hmm. of '43. Okay, so did you have a choice of going into the army, or it was my wish to go into the okay. army? Okay, and why did you pick the army? I I just wanted to get in fast, mm -hmm. the fastest thing, and you know when I was drafted, they were taking people into various things, and it seems that everyone in the class that I was in went into the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Had you ever flown before? No. Mm -hmm. The first plane I ever flew in was a B-29. Okay. If, unless you were very wealthy, nobody flew in those days. The women put on fur coats and fancy hats, men put on tuxedos, and they would fly that way. Now they come in tank tops. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> All right. And um, where did you go for your basic training? I was in the Army Air Corps. I have to tell you that in 1938, the United States had the 19th largest army in the world after Portugal. By the time we finished, we had 16 million men going to the United States Armed Forces. By the end of the war, it was a huge increase, you know, showing the might of the, the United States. and. Uh, what the Air Force did, they couldn't build enough barracks or camps, so they took over places like Atlantic City, mm -hmm. Miami Beach, took took out all the fancy furniture, put in army cots, and put the trainees for basic in there. So I was in the Croydon Arms Hotel on 38th Street and Collins Avenue in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. It was an astonishing trip. Remember, we got up at night. We came out of Camp Upton, Long Island. That's where you got your uniform and shots. and. Uh, we were on the train. Someone opened the window there and said, palm trees. So we knew we didn't know where we were going, but we knew we were south, and we got into the hotel. And it was a very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. the, the, they drilled you double to make up for living in a fancy hotel. And uh, the times when the, the thing is, they got a, it, there was a lot of discipline there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the last guy that came down for falling out at 5.30 in the morning had to go up and get his mattress and bring it downstairs, much to the jeering of everybody else. I never brought that a mattress. I go over backs and sides, come down sideways on the staircase, and really very interesting. Mm -hmm. well, now, is that your first time away from home? Really, essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. Never, never been anywhere. You know, those were that was depression times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started working when I was 12 years old, mm -hmm. so and gave all the money to my mother. Now I work and give all my money to Adele. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, once you completed your basic training, where were you sent next? Well, we went to uh, Larry Field, Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I signed up for armament school. And uh, so uh, went there and went to armament school in, at Lowry Field. And so I went to machine gun school mm -hmm. and discovered the four aircraft weapons, 30 caliber Browning machine gun, 50 caliber 20 millimeter cannon, and 37 millimeter cannon, which used only in one airplane. And I think that the 50 caliber Browning machine gun is the most amazing marvel of engineering that I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you know that gun. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, do you know the accelerator? That is a piece of pure sculpture. It belongs in a museum. <laughs> so anyway, and then uh, some people were sent out and went to various units to be armorers, you know, to maintain, mm -hmm. you know, the aircraft weapons. Then they sent me to power turret school. Started the power turrets, then in use in B-17s, B-24s. Then studied bomb shackles, and then and something new came up, and I went to Central Fire Control School, which was the system for B-29s. Now, the B-29... Where, uh, where was that school? In Right in, in uh, Lowry Field. Okay. And uh, the, the B-29 was an amazing airplane because it flew pressurized. So all the gunners were in pressure in, in compartments, and the guns in the turrets were exposed to the atmosphere. So they were remotely controlled, and so the guns were controlled by wire. Mm -hmm. So the gunner had, in his position, had the gun sight, and he controlled in one position. Top turret gunner the, had a control of two turrets, but the main turret was 40 feet away. And so he, uh, he controlled that amazing, amazing engineering. The United States is an amazing country, you know. We mm -hmm. came from nothing, you know. And then, so after that, they took a bunch of us out. And I went to, uh, they sent me to General Electric Factory in Schenectady. It was there for either two months or three months. And the, the mediator between the gunner and the gun turrets was a little computer, mm -hmm. about a cubic foot and a half of box. And all the mathematics done in gears and variable resistors. So what happened is if the uh, gunner set the range, they would start parallel but the computer would put the gun this way. As it came closer, the gun would come further to the line of sight, further away went up. It would also raise an elevation, so it went further away, gun would go up, all done by the computer. Mm -hmm. And it was so it computed lead, because they had two gyroscopes in the sight, so it would compute lead, and so if the it was going this way, the gun would fire here, like that, and hit it. And so it was very interesting then, then, well, whereabouts in Schenectady did you stay? Were you in any sort yeah, of barracks? No, we, or? We, no, we were in extended leave. They, they occasionally sent us some pay. So I remember I, I hocked my watch three times to have enough money to eat. Eventually the pay caught up with us, but the pay records were gone somewhere, and we lived in apartments. Oh, okay. I lived with three of the men, but the 13 men I went with, I went overseas with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we came back. And then <clears throat> that was you went back to Lowry Field. It? Went back to no, never went back to Lowry Field. But the B twenty nines. This group was stationed in Smoky Hill Army Airfield in Salina, Kansas. Okay. So we went there and we started each specialty worked at Salina, checking out its specialty. You know the Air Force were extremely intelligent. What they did is take an break an airplane down to various components: airframe, engine armament, you know, uh, hydraulics, you know, all of the thing. And so we were trained to do one specific thing instead of learning everything. So we worked on the airplanes and we checked out the computers in the B-29s. And when they flew overseas, then we, we went back and we followed them later. Mm -hmm. So the outfit shipped out, the airplanes, went, the B-29s went overseas. We went to uh, Miami Beach, Miami, and flew out of Miami to uh, to an unknown destination. They <laughs> didn't tell us anything then. Mm -hmm. And so we flew out of Miami. So we first stop was Brinkman Field in Puerto Rico. Now, now, were you with a crew at that point? No, it was with 13, these 13, 13 specialists okay. in that I was with okay. in the General Electric uh, factory in Schenectady. Okay. So I went to Brinkman Field, flew for seven days. So if you think you have a long flight plan now, we went. Then we went to Georgetown and British Guiana and Bell and Natal, landed at Ascension Island. Do you know where that? That's between, it's an island between South America and Africa, 
but right in the center is just a volcanic peak. Mm -hmm. When you landed there and took off, there was about this much space. They cut the whole peak off this volcanic island and <laughs> land one way. And then we went to uh, Accra, those days called Gold Coast, mm -hmm. then uh, Mataguri, and then uh, Khartoum, the Sierra Islands, Aden, then uh, Karachi, uh, where's the Tajma? Agra, and then Karagpur, where the, our, our group B-29s were based. Mm -hmm. So we caught up with them and we started working there, as ground crew. So you were part of the CBI? Yeah, I was in the CBI for 13 months. Okay. Lived all there in a tent. And you want to say, I have to tell you, some people didn't like it. And first of all, I always liked camping, you know. And uh, it was just an amazing thing that, you know, for a poor kid from the Bronx, you know, going overseas and being in exotic India, I never, I never closed my eyes when I was there. I really have to say, it was sometimes very hard, sometimes very hot, stifling, and... Uh, but I, I really was happy I was there. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, uh, on your time off, did you get to do any sightseeing or anything? Well, what happened was I flew down to Cal... In, in, in the CBI, any GI, you go to any airfield and hop a ride to anywhere that the, the say, the C-47s were going. So mm -hmm. I flew down to Calcutta. And, you know, I'd gone to music and art, so I was kind of an artist, semi-artist, an artist, a good artist. And so I bought Indian paper, but I bought Windsor and Newton paints and brushes in India. Mm -hmm. I came back and I made, when I had time off, when the airplanes were out or, you know, some, I'd go out of our perimeter. We had a zigzag barbed wire perimeter around uh, our tent area. I'd paint and draw. And I have hundreds of drawings of India. Oh, do you? Yeah, and I, my, they're all in my house. My children have them. And we have uh, stacks of and then, you know, some people didn't realize where they were and how exotic this place was. Now, far mm -hmm. from home, they'd lie in, uh, in a sack and, you know, and complain all day long. You know, Mama, take me home. But I took my pain. And then after coming to the end, when we were leaving, said, Siegel, where do you go? And I took them with me. And they had missed like a year of really seeing things, seeing mm -hmm. the wild monkeys, which were astonishing to me, or the wild animals there, or the trees, or the bamboo or the snakes came. There was a place where I used to go to go out into a place where I liked to draw. And so it was a stream. So you had jumped out about four feet off the bank, then on a big stone, and then jumped across the water. And then worked. and I went there once, and there was a big snake skin stretch out of there. So I never went that way again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we slept under mosquito netting every mm -hmm. night, very scrupulous about that drank nothing but army water. Sometimes you'd be out somewhere, you know, servicing an airplane or picking a computer out of a crash B-29, and you'd pass a well, looked so cool, so clean, so green, dripping water. I'd rather die than drink that water. Mm -hmm. So I carried two canteens at all times, mostly of hot water, because it was very hot there. And I drank only, and it was so full of chlorine, they put halazone into it, hung it in lister bags, and I drank only army water. For 13 months. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, for the next the next uh, two years, I drank only army water when I was in Okinawa. Now, was there a problem with malaria or any yes, kind of? Yes, there was a severe problem. Was very careful, and some guys got it, and they gave matabrine, and they were this color yellow. Yeah. But I did not get that. But I did have an ear infection one time, and uh, it was treated brutally, but very well because they did cure it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really did not get very sick. Just, uh, yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, I, I have to tell you, as my, uh, my mentor here reminds me, that going overseas then, we got a lot of shots mm -hmm. for, um, they didn't have a shot for malaria, but for tetanus, uh, typhoid, triple typhoid, all kinds of things. And also I got shots for dengue fever. Mm -hmm. Dengue fever known to the soldiers, a black water fever because you'd pee black or break bone fever because it was so painful. And I, so I got three painful shots that went right down before we went overseas. And I just read one of my son-in-law's medical journals said, there was no known shot for dengue fever. Now this is 60 years later. Hmm. <laughs> Did anyone come now with it uh, in your no, group? No, not that I know of, but we had uh, amoebic dysentery. Mm -hmm. You know, some people who broke the 
the discipline of not drinking anything or eating anything yeah. outside of the army, and they had to ship them home. Mm -hmm. Because they wasted down to nothing, they were, it, we could not cure them there. If they could ever be cured, they shipped those guys home. Mm -hmm. But if you, so I think that the army discipline really respected it and kept me healthy. Mm -hmm. What about uh, uh, food? Did well, you have we, a mess hall, or did we you? We had a mess hall. Mess sergeant was already Klein, who was a really very decent guy, and so we got a lot of spam, which I liked at first, which I began to hate, and then we got mostly sea ration, meat and vegetable stew. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there was a squadron fund that some guys organized, and they they would collect a couple of rupees from each one, and about once a month or every three weeks, they would go out and dicker with the Indians and bring chicken. Mm -hmm. And Artie Klein was a superb chef. Those chickens were so delicious. And but the the KPs or the guys working there sometimes eat more, eat more than their share. And the last guys that came did not get the chicken, which was like gold, you know. Mm -hmm. It was the only joy that you had. <laughs> and the, the guy said, you don't have any chicken for me? I said, you know. So I m m decided then and there, the rest of my life, I would never be late on the chow line. We'd get there in time to get the chicken. Mm -hmm. But the chicken was so, but the little chickens, the, the drumstick was about that big. Mm -hmm. And it was worth waiting for. So anyway, but the food was... Wholesome, adequate, and just so boring that you couldn't, uh, you know, it was depressing. Mm -hmm. But they did the best they could. Or I see he had big cans, he'd slam it on the can opener thing, dump it into a pot, and heat it there. I think they had kerosene heating there. And uh, the, uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. It was that or nothing. We also had uh, bread, they had started baking bread there. And the bread all came with bugs baked into it. So at first time, I am not eating that. It's disgusting. Next time, I said, well, I'll eat the bread, but I'll just pick out the... Next time, I just ate the whole thing with the bugs still in it. So it I've, like, I've heard that story before. <laughs> it, I, I assure you, sir, it's true. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, they also had a jar of... A, a can of butter on the table in the mess hall. It was a tent, really, mm -hmm. and a, a can of jam. And the butter was tropical butter, which means it would not melt in the tropics. Means it wouldn't melt in your mouth either. <laughs> so if you smeared that butter on your bread, it was like Vaseline in your mouth for the rest of the day. So I never ate that. But and then we also had a bearer. They, they so the United States Army said we lived lived in four man squad tents. Said you can hire one bearer. And we will bring him and take him back. He worked six and a half days a week. I said, but you have to pay him what we say. You pay him one rupee per week per man, which is 33 cents. So he got four rupees a week, which was 33, dollar twenty nine cents per week. And he was making more money than his father did who worked on the Bengal Nagpur Railroad. They didn't want us to pay more because they didn't want had inflation mm -hmm. to come there. But we need, we, you know, when we were out, you know, he would, like, he would air out your bedding, he would sweep the ten floor, which was dirt. He would just, uh, you know, make your bed and things and watch the guns and everything. He was a really very good kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think we're, America's an imperialist country, when we left he cried, he said, sobs, well, I do now. And I was with three of the 13 men, we were all good friends. And each one of us put our hands in our pockets, took out every rupee that we had and gave it to him. Probably got about a year's pay, and then it's like, but he, he didn't want us to leave. Mm -hmm. So, and then we left, we took nothing with us. And uh, so I think we uh, did what we had to do. Now, now what were your uh, working conditions like? Did you have a hangar or a building? Or? There, there was a building there, and some uh, stuff was done, but the computers had to be indoors. But of course, uh, working on aircraft engines and airframe mm -hmm. was outside. Now, um, now your like avionics shop where where you worked on the computers, did, did that have to be like air conditioned or anything? Or yeah, there was air conditioning. They opened the doors. <laughs> you you got to be kidding! That was about 110. Degrees. You know, I remember sometimes you have a contest. You have a little can and you have his elbow there and see if he could fill it up with sweat. It was so hot, and I I, I didn't emphasize that part of it. You know, I kind of uh, always camped in my life, and I love that. But uh, some people really suffered. Mm -hmm. And uh, hot, and the insects were unbelievable. So I remember once we had, what we did, we had a very clever tent. We 
that you had uh, Coleman lanterns. And so we'd uh, put a light out very early and wait. And uh, when the last light was off, they had all the insects. So we were relatively free of insects. But one man came in late when he on guard duty, and there were so many insects in our tent, he thought that we had fooled him and put up some sort of net, you know, to, to fool him because they would swarm all over you. Hmm. And uh, But I didn't, yeah, you know, shake your shoes out in the morning so you didn't get a scorpion in it. Mm -hmm. What about out. snakes? Did they wander into the yeah, open they, area? Uh, yeah, they they had snakes there. One, one man, I don't know who it was, who was pretty intelligent, he caught a crate, K-R-A-I-T, you know, that very poisonous small snake, and he hung it up on a tree with a uh, thumbtack, and he said, if this guy bites you, you may as well hang up your jock strap. <laughs> so, uh, but there were snakes around, but I, uh, you know, I like snakes. And uh, so it was very interesting, it was very uncomfortable. And then we went through the monsoon season, mm -hmm. which was a few, every afternoon at two o'clock, the storm, and a furious rain. I think we have rain here, and it would just rain for hours. But we ditched our tent very well, you know, and we were mm -hmm. pretty, you know, some guys who weren't were careless, left stuff lying in the ditch, would get flooded a little bit, but, you know, you dry out. And, uh, I can't say that I suffered, but some people did, but I don't think I did. Now, did you, did you do much flying at all? No, the, uh, the only time we flew was when uh, we were working on an airplane. The guy said, I have to take this up, so you want to come with us? So I flew with him, but not, not that was not my job mm -hmm. to fly. We were on ground crew. Did you ever have any contact with the enemy at all? Well, on Christmas, 1944, we were born, and we had, so it was really, I have to say, I must be stupid, I thought it was very exciting, <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 the, uh, I know it was Christmas because there was some entertainer there, and I did not go that time, I was just writing in, in my tent, and I heard the, the our air, our air warning was the, the, uh, Air raid warning were fire engines running up and down the runway with their sirens blasting. Mm -hmm. So we knew something was coming. And then all those guys came pounding up from where they were having this concert. And we went, filed in, got, you know, our guns and ammunition and uh, went down. We had zigzag trenches down this, went outside from and waited there. It was a long wait. And all of a sudden we had. Uh, <coughs> 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns manned by British troops. Mm -hmm. And then they started firing. You see, they're firing boom, 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 boom. And we saw those planes, dark plane, about two or three o'clock, came over. They had a couple of B-29s and uh, flew over. And they, we understood later they were shot down by American night fighters mm -hmm. after that. But that was the only contact. Mm -hmm. Did the unit suffer many casualties at all? No, there was some. There was some Purple Hearts given out, but uh, nobody that I knew. Mm -hmm. And they did hit between some between guys who parked on the runway. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, now, when when did you leave? We left in. Uh, Had the war ended at that point? No, no. Then no. Then. Uh, oh, also. We shipped out. Okay. We left. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just for the record, would you state uh, the unit you were with? Yeah, I was in the 22nd Air Depot Group, 58th Bomb Wing, 20th Bomber Command. Okay. And uh, when when did you end up leaving? Left left uh, after 13 months. I was there. Anyway, what happened was we left all the airplanes there, mm -hmm. some equipment, but we took most of it with us. At that time, they had B-29 bases organizing in Guam mm -hmm. and in Saipan Pacific. Of course, it's extremely hard to get B-29 operative because they had to fly the hum first to go to China. And then so some B-29s were just ferrying gasoline. Mm -hmm. Then they would bomb as close to Japan. They sank the largest floating dry dock in the world, Singapore. And then they would come back and then fly over, over again, you know. So when they got the bases in, in the Pacific, these, the, the Karagpu was no longer useful. So I was on a troop ship. So did the entire unit? The entire unit what? went. And, and you left everything behind? Le everything. I think one, one ship 
came with equipment because mm -hmm. we had a lot of equipment, you know, special tools, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, we embarked on the General H. B. Freeman because I later got a company that said, if you are on troop ship, we will supply the name, date, and where it sailed. I was on a troop ship for 46 days from India. And I, I tell you, I was with a bunch of philosophers. We discussed, you know, every, anyway, went, sailed out of uh, Calcutta, mm -hmm. the Hooghly River. First port was uh, Ceylon, when, uh, Trincomalee, took on oil and ammunition because we were, it was armed. We mm -hmm. had five, five inch uh, automatic guns there. And then we went to, uh, sailed south, landed at Perth, Fremantle in Australia, sailed around the southern part of Australia, went to Hollandia, New Guinea, to also took on oil, and then went to uh, Leyte, and then went to Okinawa, and landed in Okinawa, and the war was over. So while I was on a troop ship, the war ended. They dropped the atomic bombs. Okay. And the war ended. And do you, we, let me just go back a little bit. Sure. Do you, re, do you remember uh, where you were when, when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Yes. I, I think I was on Okinawa, and I have to tell you, soldiers cried. Mm -hmm. was the only president, I was, you know, 18, 19, it was the only president we had ever known. Mm -hmm. He was elected in 1932 and lasted until the middle of the war. Mm -hmm. So it was a very sad situation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we kind of idolized him. The country did. Not sure it was the right thing to do now, but we did then. It was, you know, it was a good image up there. Mm -hmm. So, and what was it like when uh, you heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs? Had, the had you heard any rumors about the no, bomb? Or? No, that was the most secret thing. Nobody knew about it except mm -hmm. Joseph Stalin. What was it? Uh, did you find it amazing? <laughs> the, amazing. The, the, and the yeah, destruction. We were, yeah, we were kind of the uh, like the technical people that said, "Hey, Siegel, what's an atomic bomb?" I said, you know, all I know is there's chemical energy and there's atomic energy. And this is atomic, so it was a new form of energy that they had d discovered, developed, and then used. And uh, I thought it was simply amazing. Not did not know immediately, you know, I'm sure people here at home knew more about it. You had movies and mm -hmm. things or whatever they did then. But we just knew that it was a terrible weapon, and they dropped a second one. And I think that the uh, our feelings were that the Japanese were so cruel in that war, unnecessarily cruel. And they had probably killed 25 million Chinese people between 1933 and 1945. I'm not saying that was political so much, but I knew that they were. That was a lethal culture, mm -hmm. and I think that what they got, they deserved. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, if anybody is opposed to the dropping of the atomic bomb, I'd like to speak to them. Mm -hmm. And we had to put a stop to it, you know. We read a story about some Dutch citizen that was in, you know, Dutch East Indies during the war that the Japanese had captured. It said they, the, the civilians there that they had captured were dying at the rate of 240,000 a month. So thank God we dropped the atomic bomb, we did. Mm -hmm. So that's my feeling about it. They, now, now, when the war ended, was there a lot of celebration? Yeah, the, I was on Okinawa at that time, and uh, all those, uh, we had a lot of barges with uh, rockets in them, mm -hmm. and the, the, you never saw fireworks like that. They fired, they fired them out to sea, and they were boom, 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 boom. You know, a lot of gunfire, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it was a big celebration. Mm -hmm. Now. When uh, when were you shipped back to the states? Were you still in Okinawa for yeah. for a while? Yeah, we were there because we had United States. Uh, if you look at the big picture, which I always try to do, you had guys in every little island, mm -hmm. you know, outfits here, and they are all scattered all over the Pacific, and so we waited our turn, and uh, shipped out, and came home. Now, uh, now, did you go home as an entire unit or no? Okay. Uh, no. No. You had points then. Okay. Yeah. And so I had enough points since I'd been overseas for two years. I had points enough to go home. Some people stayed there and uh, landed in San Francisco. I have to tell you an interesting story. You know, if the food was really wholesome, I have to say, but disgusting. Mm -hmm. After, if you eat sea ration meat and vegetable stew for two years, you're not going to like it. And they said, you know, when you go home, they give you the four dollar dinner. Now, $4 dinner is like the $70 dinner now, nowadays. And they say, he said, Siegel, do you think that they would give us a $4 dinner? I said, you know, 
I think they would because they always kept their word. Landed in, in uh, Camp Stone in California, on, outside of uh, San Francisco, I suppose, the Golden Gate Bridge. And when we went, when the troop ship came under, long streams of toilet paper were coming off the bridge to celebrate our homecoming. They didn't have confetti, uh -huh. so they used toilet paper. So it was very, a lot of fun. And then we got washed up, dressed, shaved and everything, went there. And there were uh, the German uh, POWs that they in North Africa were working in, in the chow line there. That, How do you want your steak? The steak, fresh milk, which I hadn't had in two years, real mashed potatoes. It was really the $4 dinner. I had confidence in my country ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Got the $4 dinner. And we shipped home, uh -huh. you know, not as individuals, you know, and came to uh, Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. Got the discharge there and then came home. Now, once you got back home, did you make use of the GI Bill? I certainly, well, I made the best use of it. I went to school on the GI Bill. They paid me $65 a month, all supplies and all tuitions. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I was 21 years old at that time, been around the world. I guess it was waiting for me in the classroom, not even 18 yet. So we went together for three years and then we got married. Now, now where did you go to college? I went to NYU. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, I took a graduate degree later at uh, Ohio State University, mm -hmm. and that gave me my last career, which I was very happy with. And uh, now, what did what did you do? I, I took the degree in medical illustration because mm -hmm. I was an artist and interested in science. And Ohio State had a program for it, so I went there and I lived. It was a two-year program, but as, since I was 45 years old, when I went back after being in the business for. 18 and a half years in a family business. I uh, I went there and I negotiated with them that I could do it as fast as I could, you know, to get through because I left a Dell, a large dog, three children, a couple of cars, <laughs> and a house in Englewood. I lived in Columbus in a little furnished room. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, and they, go, they said I could do it as fast as I wanted to. So I did 65 graduate credits in a single year. I got wow. to school seven days a week, 12 hours a day. When I even had a class on Sunday and studying and do something. And it was a, a rough course because the first thing was dissect the cadaver and learn human anatomy, mm -hmm. which I did. And, then, and so it was extremely interesting. And after that, I went there with Adele. Adele came to see me after close to the end of the courses. No time to, I didn't even take a car there. I didn't want to be a bunch of study. And uh, they offered me a job as, to, as uh, the chief of the medical illustration division at Ohio State University. But I uh, was very grateful. Adele was there, so mm -hmm. she knows that it's not, this is not puffery. And But I didn't want to, first of all, we owned Judd Hill at that time. And I would never leave that because we live in a beautiful place on a mountain right here in Halcott. And uh, so I didn't do that. But I came got a job with the Department of Surgery down in Newark, New Jersey, Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. I was there for a happy 18 and a half years. It's the world's best job. Mm -hmm. I didn't make a lot of money, but it was exactly what I wanted to do, which is amazing to get a job that you wanted. And then I retired, and I retired because I wanted to live up here in the country. Mm -hmm. So we do. Now, did you uh, join any veterans organizations? I think I joined the, joined the Jewish War Veterans at one time, but I don't know either. They lost track of me. The World War II veterans are disappearing. Mm -hmm. So I used to belong to the 58th Bombing Association, mm -hmm. and they stopped meeting. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you if you they went to any reunions or stayed in touch with well, anyone. We went, we, we, we went to the Air, the Air Museum in Connecticut, to, but I didn't see anybody there. And then uh, they had a computer in the corner there, and so they had a ribbon there, but I stepped over the ribbon to look at it, to get a close look at it refresh my memory after so many years. And I said, sir, you're not allowed to be here. I said, you know, I used to work on this equipment overseas. He said, oh, go ahead. <laughs> so I told him all about, you know, the various things. It was an amazing development that we did there. The United States is an amazing country. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize it, mm -hmm. with what we accomplished in those short years. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Oh, well, I think it really, oh, I, I, I have to say that I did not suffer mm -hmm. in service. I really, I was open to wonder. You know, I liked basic training, which was very hard and very tough, but uh, they had the, uh, an obstacle 
course there called the Burma Road. So after we ran it, you would be dismissed and go and wash up for lunch. But I was uh, with a few guys. We used to run it the second time to just, just to show them they weren't so tough. <laughs> so I, I have to say, I had a, uh, it was an enlightening, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. And to fly overseas and to be even on the troop ship, you know, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I told everybody I was in a troop ship for 34 days when I read the manifest for the General H.B. Freeman run troop ship from, from Calcutta to Okinawa around 46 days. But you lost track of the days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think uh, you would have gone on to, to college had it not been for the GI Bill? I would have gone to any college that was free. Because mm -hmm. even when I went to college, I, even when I went to school in a GI Bill and I was courting Adele, I got a job. I, I got $65 a month, gave $35 a month to my mother for, for my living at home, and I took a job in the post office four hours a day, five days a week, to have enough money to court it. And she didn't require money. <laughs> she had very modest, great times we had with going sketching mm -hmm. in boat yards in Staten Island. Remember? Yeah. She's my witness. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to touch on that maybe we missed? I, uh, I can't think of anything. Do you have any questions, huh? Do you have any questions, sir? Um, just something about your time in Okinawa. You were there for 11 months. Yeah, well, uh... Basically, did you do the same thing in Okinawa? Yeah, but after the war was over, mm -hmm. you know, then that they started just scrapping the aircraft and not working on them and they were just making time there and I did a lot of drawing there. I had my paper, I paint and I, I kept, I was really busy. Mm -hmm. I never just, somehow, you know, I just wanted to go mm -hmm. and do things so I did it. Did you have uh, much interaction with the civilian population on Okinawa? No, it was forbidden. When I was there they were all behind wire, even the civilians and we didn't mistreat them. Mm -hmm. uh, we just kept them separate so you never met I all the movies about having fun in Okinawa with the women it was just, just in, in the time that I was there not true you mm -hmm. had no contact with them whatsoever mm -hmm. and uh, we had our own tent area and we lived there and uh, sometimes you get a jeep or a truck and take a ride around and see things but no civilians really. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see any Japanese POWs? Or? Well, I had, as a matter of fact, I had four. I have a picture of myself. They, I had four Japanese POWs. That You know, the Army general orders are when you capture an enemy. If he's, if he's disarmed, you may not hurt him. You have to feed him your own ration, you know, Army rations. You have to keep him clothed, and you have to pass him up to the next higher command. Mm -hmm. So you could, it was never legal to harm a POW, mm -hmm. but so we passed up four and they asked me to guard them. So I, I have a picture of myself standing very informally in a t-shirt saying Smoky Hill Army Airfield, carrying a carbine and these four guys and uh, passed them on. Mm -hmm. so they went up to some sort of POW camp somewhere on the island. Mm -hmm. Maybe eventually repatriated to Japan, but that was above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. So I was just a conduit the POWs, but one of them was quite belligerent. Now, what happened is some men built a ring on Okinawa, a boxing ring, and I used to box, and I liked it, and uh, this guy must have seen me, because when he, when I had him, he asked me if I, if I wanted to fight him, and here I am, you know, ready to go home, looking forward to going home. I'm going to fight with a POW and I have to be insane. So I just took my right carbine out and I patted it like that. I said, you know, back off. I'm not going to fight you because I know that I would have to kill him or he'd have to kill me. Mm -hmm. So I would not fight. You know, there was no profit in it for me. Mm -hmm. And so Abdel told me that. But I have a picture of myself with these four guys. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your well, interview. Oh, that was fun. I could tell the same story again. <laughs> <laughs>